My name is Marie Rippingale and I am going to be talking you through this narrated PowerPoint on what equine veterinary nurses can do in practice. So it's important to know what an equine veterinary nurse is. Um, so an equine veterinary nurse is someone who has completed the necessary training through an accredited qualification to become a veterinary nurse. And as you'll know, if you've read the other literature we've produced, the qualification is really quite extensive and it's very well assessed. So they will have done a number of years of training, maybe two to three years, um, doing all sorts of things, working in practice as well, doing um, an electronic portfolio, doing written exams, practical exams um, and assignments as well. Um, and if they're going to be doing studying the equine species, they will probably have been working in equine veterinary practice for the majority of that qualification. So once they're qualified, um, after the rigorous assessment, they can apply to go onto the Royal College of Veterinary Surgeons Register for Veterinary Nurses, and they can then call themselves a registered veterinary nurse or an RVN. And that then enables the RVN to undertake certain privileges, and these are set out under the Veterinary Surgeons Act um, under Schedule 3. So a little bit about Schedule 3. Um, it basically um, defines who can carry out um, treatment on animals. Um, and dispensations from the Veterinary Surgeons Act are outlined in Schedule 3. Um, and that states that only registered veterinary nurses and enrolled student veterinary nurses have the legal dispensation to, and the definition is, give medical treatment or carry out acts of minor surgery not involving entry into a body cavity. Um, so those are the rules that we um, have to comply with as registered veterinary nurses. So we can carry out medicinal treatment um, and minor acts of surgery, um, but the main boundary is we are not allowed to enter a body cavity. So also for an RVN to give treatment under Schedule 3 of the Veterinary Surgeons Act, it must be carried out under the direction of the veterinary surgeon employer. So for in order to carry out Schedule, procedure, schedule 3 procedures, we have to be employed in um, a veterinary practice by a veterinary surgeon um, and all of the treatments that we carry out must be requested by a veterinary surgeon. So we're not just treating animals as and when we feel like it, we're treating them because we've been directed to by a veterinary surgeon. Um, it's very important to make the distinction that we are not allowed to diagnose conditions. That is very specifically undertaken by veterinary surgeons. We are working with the veterinary surgeons to treat the patients um, in their care. So what exactly are we qualified to do in practice? Um, well, I'm slightly biased, but I would say that we are an essential part of the equine team. Um, we are qualified to carry out the following. So intravenous injections and intramuscular injections, and also when required, we can also do subcutaneous injections as well. We can carry out intravenous catheterization. And following that, in some cases, we can administer fluid therapy, which will have been prescribed by the veterinary surgeon and dose rates and calculations will have been discussed. And we can also administer blood transfusions. Again, obviously, this will have been prescribed by a veterinary surgeon. We can carry out blood sampling and nasogastric tubing. And we can also perform radiography. So we can take x-rays, but it's important to say that we will not be diagnosing conditions from the x-rays. We are just getting the views for the vet then to diagnose at a later time. And also the, the x-ray needs to be requested by a veterinary surgeon as well. We're not just x-raying horses because we feel like it. We are doing all of this under the direction of a veterinary surgeon. We can undertake lab work. So that might be manual lab work such as um, PCV, urinalysis, um, bacteriology. Um, but we can also use the lab machines, obviously, with, within a working lab. Um, and also a very common lab task for um, equine veterinary nurses is worm egg counts. So we might assist with those as well. We can assist with anaesthesia. So this is usually in combination with a veterinary surgeon. Um, so we will be assisting with the anaesthesia, but it's very rare that we are left fully in charge of the anaesthetic without a specific veterinary surgeon um, allocated to that procedure. And we'll also assist with surgery. So just as with small animal nurses, we can scrub in and assist with um, the surgery that's taking place as well as helping out in theatre, um, being an assistant and a scrub nurse at the same time. 
and essential inpatient care. So monitoring vital parameters, TPRs, making sure the gut sounds are good, um, digital pulses, um, and obviously equally as important as taking the parameters is reporting them back to the veterinary team as well. Um, so we have a big role in communication um, with the readings that we've taken and we are specifically trained to know which re readings are normal and which are abnormal so that we know when to pass that information on as well. We can carry out wound care and bandaging. So bandaging is quite a popular task for veterinary nurses and um, we like a good deep bandage. Um, but we're also specifically trained to look at wound care so we know how wounds are progressing and also when we need to alert the veterinary surgeon um, that the patient needs further care or a change in treatment. And we can remove casts as well um, and apply cast bandages. So it's not just a general bandage that we can do. Um, we're also trained in other kinds of bandages that the patient might need. So other roles alongside these main ones, um, assisting with lameness examinations. So helping with trot ups, lunging, um, but kind of more, may, maybe more specifically, um, prepping patients for nerve blocks um, and joint blocks. So clipping and scrubbing in the correct manner. Um, making sure we've got all the equipment ready um, and making sure everything's ready for the vet when they come to perform the procedure. We have a role in organising the hospital, so talking to the case vets and the hospital vets in the morning, making sure we've got a plan ready, making sure we've got enough staff ready and making sure that all the patients are prioritised correctly and treated um, as they should be. After a year of being qualified, we can then go on to train to be a clinical coach. And this is the person that specifically guides the student nurses through their um, electronic portfolio or their nursing progress log, um, assisting and supporting and helping um, the nurses to get qualified and essentially kind of training the nurses of the future. We can also lecture the nurses that might be within the workplace or it might be through a college um, or other organisation where we can share our skills and knowledge um, with the next generation of veterinary nurses. And we can also be used to teach vet students as well. If they're already in the practice and they're working alongside nurses, um, then we can talk them through procedures, show them how to carry out x-rays, um, TPRs and checks on patients, and actually show them what role we have in the hospital as well um, as assisting them and supporting them through their studies. We also have a big role in client care, um, so admitting and discharging patients and also just providing some education to the clients as well. Um, so kind of assess assisting and sharing our knowledge with the clients too, so they shouldn't be forgotten. So the value of registered veterinary nurses in practice, um, we've often invested a lot of time and effort in the qualification. It does take two to three years and it's very heavily assessed. So people who've got the qualification are generally really quite committed. I take an enormous amount of pride in the clinical work that I carry out as well. Um, so we really do have high standards. Um, so any tasks that can be delegated to us really should be um, because we really enjoy carrying them out. We want to carry them out. That, that's part of you know, our pride in our job. So we really want to do these um, treatments and, and um, perform these procedures. So allowing us to perform the clinical tasks um, can free up vets basically to carry out other tasks that we're not maybe trained or qualified to do and that can increase the, the efficiency of the veterinary team um, but it can also encourage um, veterinary nursing retention in the profession because we have a big problem with nurses getting to a certain age and then leaving the profession for whatever reason and we lose all that skills, all those skills and knowledge then just leave um, which is a bit of a shame um, so if we could use nurses maybe a little bit more, give them a bit more um, free reign to do what they've been um, qualified to do they might stay in the profession a little bit longer which would actually benefit everybody. So examples of how we could be used in practice, um, so radiography, um, during a lameness workup um, a veterinary surgeon may delegate the act of taking the radiographs to a registered veterinary nurse and that can free them up to go off and carry out ultrasound scans or maybe nerve block another case if they've got maybe two or three lamenesses running at the same time. Um, a registered veterinary nurse can carry out that series of, of radiographs for them while they go into another exam room and carry out other treatment on another patient. Um, and that just speeds everything up in the day, makes sure everything gets done efficiently and obviously allows their RVN to um, perform one of the procedures that they're trained to perform. Inserting IV catheters, so maybe during preoperative preparation, um, a vet may delegate the act of inserting an intravenous catheter and carrying out the preoperative checks to an RVN. 
um, and then they can go off, carry out diagnostic procedures, assess and treat other cases. So we can be doing this um, with, with another member of staff and the vet can go off and they can be treating another case, you know, do actually doing the diagnosing and what they're trained to do. And we can be putting the catheter in and checking and monitoring the patient like we're, we're trained to do as well. So it's win win. And also, if applicable, um, we can insert IV catheters into patients that need intravenous fluids and we can set up the fluids and we can um, get those patients going on those IV fluids and we can monitor them as well. Um, obviously, the fluids will be prescribed by the veterinary surgeon and we would have discussed um, the dose and the dose rate with them beforehand. But we can get all that done um, while the vet goes off and, and treats other patients or, or you know, talks to clients or, or anything else that they need to do. Other examples, so administering medication, um, a vet may delegate the administration of medication um, to an RVN um, and then we can administer the medication to the patient. Maybe the vet can then go out on calls if they're an ambulatory vet for the day or they can get on with the cases in the hospital. So things like um, uh, eye medication that might need to be given every two hours, every four hours, every six hours. You know, we can write that down. We can get that information from the vet at the start of the day and then we can administer that medication throughout the day without that vet having to come back and do that every so often. We can just do that throughout the day and then we can update the vet when they come back later about the case and how that's going. And it just frees up a lot of time and um, the vet can then go out and do whatever else they need to do. And we're quite happy to administer that medication and to monitor that patient. Wound care. So vets can delegate wound care and bandage changes to RVNs. Um, obviously, we will update update the vet on the wound care. Um, and that will, again, free time up for the vet as well to go out and do something else or to be doing another procedure while we're doing that. We can also remove casts and carry out wound care on those as required as well, as long as, of course, we're updating the vet and um, the case vet all the time about progress. So sedation. Um, an RVN can sedate patients. Um, we really do need the veterinary surgeon to be on the premises um, and the veterinary surgeon does need to decide the dose of sedation to be given as well. Um, but once that's been decided, we can go on and we can sedate that patient and carry on with the procedure, obviously, while the vet goes and treats another case. There's a big role in ambulatory in equine practice with RVNs as well, and this is something that is not utilised enough in equine practice. So almost verging on district nursing, although obviously that's not an official role yet, but it's being worked on at the moment. But we can be used in, in ambulatory roles as well. So examples of that would be to be sent out to perform radiography on a patient that does not require sedation. So maybe um, a laminitic um, that's not going to move around, not going to go anywhere because they're sore. We can go out. We can perform those radiographs and then obviously the radiographs will either be interpreted at the yard if the vet is there or back at the clinic. Um, so we would either be taking the images while the vet does something else on the visit um, or we will be taking, going out, taking the images and then bringing them back to the clinic for the vet to diagnose from. We can go out and perform bandage changes on yards. So again, we wouldn't want a patient that needed to be sedated, but um, we could go out, we could take the bandage off, have a look at the wound, put a bandage back on and then obviously update the case vet on the wound healing progress when we get back to the clinic. Or we could be going out on a yard visit with one of the vets and we can be performing the bandage change while they're doing vaccines or something else that requires a veterinary surgeon. And we can update them on the yard at the same time. And it just speeds up the whole process um, of that visit then if, if they're, we're there as well performing procedures at the same time. And of course, foal care. So we can assist with sick foals, whether that be out on studs or on yards. So we can go out and perform foal checks or we can go out with the vet and we could administer specialist care to those foals alongside the veterinary surgeon um, or going out on visits and, and performing um, procedures that we are qualified to do. And then obviously taking back that information to the vets to decide on a further treatment plan. Administering medication. Um, we um, could be asked to go out and administer medication, so either anti-inflammatories or antibiotics. And I'm thinking more here about IV and IM as opposed to oral that the owners can do themselves. Um, providing that the medication and the amount of medication has been prescribed by the case veterinary surgeon, there is no reason why we can't go out and administer that medication um, for that patient without the vet having to go out on the visit, without the vet having to leave the clinic. Um, or we could do it on the yard at the same time as the vet's there and they can be getting on with something else. So, again, it's just freeing time up as well whilst using our skills and knowledge um, to everyone's best advantage, really. And client advice as well. So 
We can go out on visits to yards and we can talk to clients about things like home care, following treatment at the clinic, um, rehabilitation, and maybe environmental management of cases as well. So if a, a case needs a certain kind of environmental management, then we can go out and show the owner how to do that, discuss with them what their facilities are and kind of come to an agreement on how best that case is going to be managed. And obviously all this will be carried out after consultation with the veterinary surgeon. So they will tell us what they want and what they expect and what they want us to say. And we'll go out and we'll, we'll talk to the owners and then we'll take that information, obviously, um, back to the case fair as well. So everyone's aware of what's happening with that patient. So in conclusion, RVNs are an asset to any equine team. Um, we're very highly skilled professionals who should really be used to their full potential in practice. Um, this allows us to feel valued and fulfilled in our chosen career as well. So we're more likely to stay in the profession and pass on our skills on to more people, um, get more people trained. Um, obviously, tasks should be delegated in line with Schedule 3 of the Veterinary Surgeons Act. So everything we do needs to be governed by Schedule 3 and everything we do needs to be within that. Um, but using registered veterinary nurses to our full potential in practice does allow vets to be freed up. It increases the efficiency of the team. Um, and I think it gives a, an overall um, feeling of well-being as well. So if we're being used to everything that we can um, do and then the vets are being freed up, that's less stress for them. They can go off and do whatever they need to do. Um, and it's just working effectively as a team. Um, and when we are used efficiently, I think we are our happiest and we're more likely to stay in the profession. So thank you very much for listening to this narrated PowerPoint. There are a few acknowledgements um, that I'd like to bring to your attention. So to Bonnie, who has been helping me with the PowerPoint and then supplying some of the images as well. Um, to Beaver um, for supporting um, the PowerPoint um, and the, the project to kind of get more recognition for equine nurses. And also to the BVNA as well um, for helping us and allowing us to be involved with the Veterinary Nursing Awareness Month, which is happening in May. So if you want any more information about um, any of this, then please go to the Beaver website or Facebook page or the BVNA website and Facebook page. And thank you for listening.